presentation by doing a rewind, because as Stuart suggested, my life didn't start talking about the circular economy, but it started somewhere very different. And it started with the sport of sailing. I was lucky enough, as a four-year-old girl, to experience sailing for the first time. I will never, ever forget the feeling that I felt as I saw the water for the first time, because I grew up in the countryside. I remember seeing the boat for the first time. I remember climbing on board the boat for the first time. But the most amazing feeling for me as that four-year-old girl was to feel the sense of freedom that I felt when those sails were hoisted. And as a four-year-old, I think that's the greatest sense of freedom that you can ever imagine, because that boat at that moment could have literally taken us anywhere in the world. And I started my career in sailing as that four-year-old girl with a dream. And I think when we're young, when we're children, anything and everything is possible. And so often in life, the challenge is hanging on to that as we grow up. And for me, I came from the countryside. I was never going to become a round-the-world sailor. But I had that dream, I had that goal, that goal to one day, which I decided there and then, that goal to sail around the world. And what I did was I tried to take little steps towards that goal. So initially, at school, it was reading everything I could about sailing every book I could find, asking as many questions as I could about sailing every summer. Then I started, when I went to secondary school, saving my school dinner money change. So every single day from age 11 to 17, I had for lunch mashed potato and baked beans. They cost four pence each, and gravy was free, so I poured the gravy on, and I saved the change. And I saved the change every day until that little pile of change would reach a pound, and when it reached a pound, I would drop it into my money box and cross off one of the hundred squares that I'd drawn on a piece of paper. Finally, when that reached a hundred, and it wasn't often, I could go along to the bank and put my money in to save for that little boat that there I am sitting in the garden in. And so I dreamt of sailing around the world. I left school when I was 17. I didn't think when I was young that you could sail around the world any way other than going out, getting a job, earning enough money, and then one day, if I was lucky enough, I would be able to buy a boat and sail around the world. But when I was studying, aged 17, working for my A-levels, I was trying to be a, a veterinary surgeon at the time, I was struck down with glandular fever. And for one month, I was flat. And as that 17-year-old girl, your whole career bounces off those A-levels. You think it's everything. You think it's your whole life. And actually, being ill then was really bad because it was just before my exams. But actually, for me, it was one of the best things that happened it made me stop and it made me think and it made me think at a time there was a round the world race on the television the Whitbread round the world race 1994 and I borrowed my grandmother's video recorder and I recorded this program at three o'clock in the morning and then I watched the images of people racing around the world and they had done that finding sponsorship and at that moment I decided I would follow that route so I left school just two months later during my animals, I went to work for sailing school, and I lived on the floor in the radio room, teaching sailing, learning about sailing, asking as many questions as I possibly could to everybody that I met who was involved in that life on the water. The following year, I sailed solo around Great Britain, and just four years after leaving school, I was sitting in a boardroom, having written over 5,000 letters in front of a man who I knew who made the decision as to whether or not one day I'd be able to sail around the world. And that guy said yes. And when I sat in the design meeting, the, just the design meeting designing this boat, with some of the best yacht designers in the world, I could not believe I was living my life. As we drew those first lines on a piece of paper, I could not believe this was real. And the first time that I sailed Kingfisher down in Auckland Harbour, I was so happy. If my life had ended there and then, I would have been one of the happiest people on the planet. Because I was sailing the most beautiful boat, which the following winter, I was going to race solo non-stop around the world. And racing around the world tends to be a French sport. I moved to France. I prepared for the Vendée Globe. My first race was a solo transatlantic race, which actually we won against the competitors that winter I'd be racing against around the world. And then November 2000, I was 24 years old, there I was on the start line of the Vendée Globe, about to do the thing that I'd absolutely dreamt of, to race a boat non-stop around the world, to go to sea for three and a half months, racing against 24 other competitors. You don't see land when you race around the world. If you see Cape Horn, you're lucky. 
There's no support vessel that goes with you. You all set off and you go for, to sea for three and a half months. And not so many of those boats will actually finish that journey. It's extraordinary. You race down in the Southern Ocean through the icebergs. I took that photo and you could have sailed Kingfisher into that cave, even with a 100 foot high mast. It was amazing. Racing through the Southern Ocean is extraordinary. You are two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest town. If something goes wrong, it takes five days to get a ship to you, and then five days for that ship to take you back into port. You're literally in the middle of nowhere, but it's the most extraordinary experience you could ever imagine. You're managing the boat. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the boat is sailing. You don't slow down at night, you push as hard as you can for the full time that you're out in that race. You push and push until you cross that finish line. And it's amazing. It's amazing to be at sea for that period of time. And for me, the downside was crossing the finish line. Because being at home for me was at sea. My goal since that age of four years old was to race around the world. And the moment I crossed that finish line, it was over. And that had led me through my entire life to sail around the world. And at that moment, it was gone. And that was at a time when your life changes forever. I wanted to sail around the world. I didn't want to be someone that was recognized in the street. I didn't want to be someone that was in all the newspapers. It was a part of the job, but it changed my life forever. And six months after the finish of that journey, I knew I was going around the world again because my home was at sea. That's where I felt that I could be me. And the second time, I chose not to race around the world, but to try and break a record. To be the fastest person ever to sail solo non-stop around the world. The record, when we built B&Q for that very task, stood at 93 days. And just as we launched her, down in Australia, the record was taken from 92 down to 72 days. And everyone said that will stand for a decade, and it deserved to because a French guy took a boat 25% bigger than that one around the world that was designed to be sailed by 10 people. Not only did he make it, but he took 20 days off the record. So the bar when we set off was high. High because the record was so short, but also high because he'd sailed a much bigger boat. So we had to push so hard. And when we built her, nobody had ever made it solo non-stop around the world in a multi-hull. Because these are dangerous boats, they're lively, they're wet, they go very fast, there's a lot of stress involved, in, both in the engineering of the boat and also in yourself, because you're sailing so quickly. <coughs> Things go wrong in seconds. There were 11 guys on this boat, and that flipped in no time. They didn't intend to capsize the boat, obviously, but it still happened. And when you see those figures on the right-hand side of the picture, hanging onto the net, and you see how far down the sea is, it makes you realize you wouldn't want to do that in the same ocean, two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest town, when the waves are twice the height of this room. That would not be a good idea. But it makes you prepare, and it makes you think, and it makes you practice. And going through experiences such as this was important for me, because I was one of those five characters. That took five seconds to capsize that boat. And everything was fine. There was no stress, it was windy, but we were sailing beautifully. And then we just tapped something, just hit something on the rudder, the orange thing that steers the boat at the back. And then five seconds later, we were upside down. And so that around the world was not only an extraordinary experience, but probably spending three months of your life with the highest stress levels you could ever imagine. It's a bit like driving a car. You know, if you're doing 20, 30, 40 kilometers an hour, it's not very stressful. Take that to 60, 80, 100, 120, 40, 60, 200. You're gripping the wheel with white knuckles, trying to keep the car on the road. That's just what it's like when you race around the world. You're keeping the boat on the road, and you're keeping the boat sailing as fast as possible, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You tend to sleep more in the day than you do at night, because at night the sailing is harder. You can't see so clearly. You sleep in five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minute snatches, occasionally an hour, very rarely two hours, and only once in three months did I sleep for three hours in a row. So it really is broken sleep, because you can only sleep when the weather lets you. Because if the wind is up and down, if the wind is gusty, you cannot switch off. It doesn't matter if it's five knots or 50 knots. The stable wind is what allows you to switch off. 
So you live in a different world. You live in a boat that you manage. Every decision on that boat you take, you look at not only the electricity in the boat, the food in the boat, the equipment you have in the boat, but you look at the weather systems. You look at the water temperature. You look at the iceberg routes. You look at what the wind's doing. You look at what the sea's doing. You look at what the mountains of the earth are doing beneath the sea because they change the currents and they change what will happen to the waves on the surface. You live as part of this huge system. But on that boat, you manage everything that you have. I took with me 475 litres of diesel, half a tonne, just to power a generator which ran two autopilots and a computer. That was for a sailing boat. There was no engine on the boat apart from the generator just to get around the world. Food, one bag for seven days. Gas, every seven days, a small gas bottle. That needed to last me seven days. All you have is freeze-dried food and the smallest and lightest camping gas cooker you can ever imagine. And as you go around the world, you see every bag get less. You see the fuel tank go down. You see the 10-litre header tank fill up and empty, fill up and empty. So you can keep that boat on the road. You can keep the boat powering through the water. You can keep the voltage in the batteries to make sure the boat stays the right way up. Because if the battery voltage falls too low, five seconds later the boat will be upside down because the autopilot that steers it will just let go. No electricity. And what you develop when you race around the world on a boat like B&Q, in fact any boat, is you realise what finite really means. What you have on that boat is all you have. There is no more. And never in my life had I translated that notion, that understanding of finite, before to anything other than that time at sea. But when I crossed that finish line, successfully having broken the record, I realised that our global economy is no different. We too have finite resources that push our economy, that our economy relies on to run. And I needed to understand more. It was a bit like picking up a stone and seeing something beneath it and having two choices. You either put that stone back down and carry on with your dream job, which it really was, of racing solo around the world, or you put it to one side and you start to learn more about something you understand nothing about. I had no background in econ economics, I didn't understand economics, I'd never looked at global resources, but I needed to understand more. I couldn't put that rock back down again and carry on. And so I started to learn and I began a journey of looking at a slightly different horizon, looking at the global economy, speaking to experts, scientists, speaking to economists, speaking to lecturers, speaking to farmers, speaking to as many people as I could possibly find to try and understand how this massive global system works that is our global economy. How does it function? Where do the resources come from? How many years of these resources are left? I was full of questions. Everything was a question as I went about this new journey of looking towards the future.